begin with a quote by that famous uh, and celebrated American philosopher, uh, W.C. Fields, <laughs> who once said, there comes a time in human events when we must seize the bull by the tail and stare the situation squarely in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're going to do tonight. So Arnie Gunderson, please take it away. The, uh, the thing I'd like to talk about, and Jim alluded to it, is how the nuclear industry has so successfully framed this, uh, this argument on, on, on nuclear. Um, there's a book, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. You know, it's the first thing you think of as an elephant. You know? <clears throat> and the, the person who frames the argument usually wins the argument. Um, we wind up uh, being labeled as uh, you know, anti-nuclear this is or that. So, and the, the, you never call them pro-nuclear zealots. You know, there's a, the, they've been able to frame the, the argument. Um, and here's an example. What's wrong with this sentence? Um, the, the Fukushima accident happened on March 11th, 2011. Accident. Accident. That's one. There's actually three, but but uh, the, the first it's one still is still happening. The, the first, yes, it's still happening, right? Yeah. So, when, you, when the nuclear industry talks about Fukushima in the past tense, they win. Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is that it's still bleeding into the Pacific and it will take a hundred years and a half a trillion dollars to clean up. But they want you to think it's over. So, access, so one is it's still happening. Two is the word accident. And accident's when you're driving down the road and an owl flies in front of you and hits your window and takes you, takes you out. That's an accident. You couldn't foresee it. But the Diet Commission, um, Diet is their parliament, has said this is not an accident. This was man-made. This was profoundly man-made. Um, engineers knew it for 40 years. So the, 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 uh, the wick on this time bomb was lit in 1967 when they started building it. And it happened to have exploded in, in 2011. But the, um, the, the, the accident was not an accident. It was a man-made disaster. So I try to remove that from my vocabulary, but I, I you know, it's so ingrained uh, because I was an engineer, and, uh, and I, but I will bet everybody will call it an accident. It's ingrained. It's not an accident. It's a disaster. And the, and the last one is, uh, I said the Fukushima accident. Fukushima is a wonderful prefecture, and um, they would much rather we call it Fukushima Daiichi, which stands for the first nuclear site at Fukushima. And then the, down the road, about <coughs> six miles, is Fukushima Daini. Um, it's sort of like having the California accident. That it it um, it means something to the people in, in Fukushima Prefecture that the um, uh, that the disaster be properly phrased as the Daiichi accident. Anyway, let's uh, let's get on with the, the show here. There's four points I I like to uh, like to talk about. Um, the first is that. Um, uh, Nuclear accidents happen a lot more frequently than uh, our regulators events. would like. Events, nuclear events. Nuclear disasters. Okay, there we go. <coughs> there we go. Nuclear events uh, happen um, a lot more frequently than our regulators would like you to know, and that our politicians would like you to know, and the nuclear industry would like you to know. Um, as time goes by, these disasters have been getting worse, not less worse. Um, the, the third one is as bad as Fukushima Daiichi was, we're lucky because it could have been much, much worse. And the third, and it really hits here in California and the West Coast, is that radiation knows no borders. So in my lifetime, here's, here's what I looked like right out of college. <laughs> No, that guy, look at that tie. It looks like I had a rug on or something like that. <laughs> so uh, that guy was, was brighter than the one who's standing here, but, but probably was a little less wise. So I'd like to say that my wisdom might have increased and perhaps my intellect decayed a little bit. But uh, over our joint career of 40-some-odd years, here's what's happened. First, we've had a partial meltdown at Three Mile Island. Right. We've had a complete meltdown at Chernobyl. Yeah. We've had a complete meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1, a complete meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 2, 
and a complete meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. So in those 35 years, from TMI to today, we've had seven meltdowns. We've had five meltdowns. So if you take 35 and divide by five, this is not rocket science, you get seven. About once every seven years, about once a decade, you're going to have a meltdown. That's what the history shows. But yet the regulators and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry have been telling the political elites that the chance of an accident is one of a million. And so if you take a million and divide that by 400 nuclear reactors, you get an accident, and I'll use accident there because you get a disaster uh, occurring about once every 2,500 years. Well, history is telling us it's once in seven, and yet regulators are basing their decision-making process on once in 2,500 years. So this is an example how the, uh, the argument has been distorted by the nuclear industry and, and uh, unfortunately it dramatically affects our congressmen. Who in Congress would allow Diablo to run if they thought it was going to melt down in, in seven years? So the, the, um, the first point here is that uh, policy makers are in one world and the uh, real world data is in another. So the second issue is that the accidents have become worse. Disasters have become worse. I go myself. Um, the first one is, uh, is TMI. There's a partial meltdown, sort of like being partially pregnant. The, the, the team that took this picture has an interesting story uh, to talk about the mindset of nuclear power. They ran a, about a year after the accident. They, the after the disaster. A year after the by the time I'm done here, I'll get this right. <coughs> About a year after the disaster, they put a camera in from the top of the reactor. And the, the, this is a true story from the people that were on that, uh, on that crew. Um, they went down however many meters until where the reactor core uh, should have been, and they didn't see it. So they pulled the camera up and said, something's wrong with our measurement. And they remeasured the wire, and they put it back in a second time, and they didn't see it. They still pulled it back out again. They said, something's wrong with our measurement. The core's got to be there. They put it down a third time, and they didn't see it. And it was the third time that the person in charge of that said, oh my god, we had a meltdown. <laughs> Two years after, with huge radiation releases, and the psyche of the nuclear industry was such that they wouldn't admit to themselves they had a meltdown until this picture came out. <laughs> So the uh, consequences are not just in meltdowns, they're also in uh, casualties. If you go up on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's website, uh, no one was hurt at Three Mile Island. And of course the industry says it too. This is Dr. Steve Wing, and uh, the, the white line that runs diagonally through that, from, the, from here to there, that's the Susquehanna River. This is Three Mile Island. And what Steve was able to do was look at the demographic data of uh, lung cancer deaths 10 years after the accident. And he shows clearly that lung cancers in the river valley were awful compared to lung cancers on the hillsides. Why is that? When the accident happened, the, the disaster happened, happened, when the meltdown happened, <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, um, there was a temperature inversion that day. And it kept the radiation in the valley. Now, the nuclear industry won't admit this, and Steve's taken a lot of flack over it. But in fact, this is what the data says. People did die after TMI. This is a picture of the remnants of the nuclear core at Chernobyl. It's called the elephant's foot. It was taken by a robot about a year after the accident. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, after the disaster, after the meltdown. Um, and the, um, uh, this, Elephant's foot is so radioactive that if it were up here, we'd all be dead in about two minutes. That's how much radiation is coming off that elephant's foot right now. But we had a picture of what Three Mile Island looked like, and we had a picture of what uh, Chernobyl looked like within two years of the uh, of the accident disaster. <coughs> so the, the the next slide. Of course, we all know that Europe was uh, highly <coughs> contaminated. Um, as a result of the, the, the meltdown at Chernobyl. Um, Dr. Alexei Yablokov uh, 
calculates that over a million people uh, will die from the, uh, the radiation releases. The International Atomic Energy Agency says about 40 die. There's a big difference there. So now let's move on to Fukushima Daiichi. Where's the course? Nobody knows. We're five years into this process and we don't have, even have a picture of where those nuclear cores are. So the trend has been from a partial meltdown to a complete meltdown to three complete meltdowns. And we don't, the radiation levels are so high in that building that we can't find those nuclear cores yet. Next slide. This is a, a real quick sequence. Um, there, this, this is um, from left to right. This is Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. It's already exploded. Two, three, four. I want you to keep an eye on three. That's this one right here. Next slide. This can't happen. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you can't have a hydrogen explosion and you can't have a detonation shockwave in a nuclear power plant. So don't worry. What you see here didn't happen. <laughs> um, and and the, the example is Diablo Canyon can't withstand this. And so what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says is that this event cannot happen. So therefore, Diablo Canyon can continue to operate. So that middle slide here shows the initial burst of the, uh, of the explosion, the detonation shockwave. And the rest after that is uh, ballistic. It just takes the roof off the building. Uh, but don't worry, this can't happen at Diablo Canyon. You're going to click it 21 times. shockwave. There's not a containment in the world that can withstand a detonation shockwave. So the regulator's solution is to assume that a detonation shockwave can happen. <laughs> the, the next slide is a, a, another problem that the regulators have managed to corral. And that's that containments don't leak. That's the, the dome at, um, at both Diablo and at, at San, San Onofre. That uh, thing that looks like a, a half a hemisphere. Um, that's the containment building. And I was uh, discussing this, I, I was invited to talk to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, the 17 wise men that guide the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, back in 2010, four months before Fukushima Daiichi. And I was arguing that containments do leak and that they need to change their regulations, especially on a new reactor. But, after that, the next month, the NRC staff, 4,000 staff members, wrote a position paper to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They said, we assume the containment leak rate is zero. Well, what happens here, this is a, a, an infrared picture of um, Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. And it's almost a month after the nuclear accident. The big <laughs> disaster. <laughs> the, uh, the, the big blob is the um, fuel pool, which is boiling and mixing with air. And you can see there's only a couple words on here that are in English. It was about 62 degrees centigrade. And, but that means it was about 130 degrees in the gases that are coming off. Uh, that was a big deal. And it was also doing the same thing at Unit 4 and, and every other one. The fuel pools were boiling. But that's not the key here. See that little dot right there? It says 128 degrees centigrade. What that means is that that's about 250 degrees. If you remember, water boils at 212 at atmospheric conditions. What that tells me is that the containment was leaking like a sieve. There's no containment integrity in Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. And this is another one of those issues that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has pushed aside. There's a, a telecons between uh, NRC and, and people in Tokyo, and they estimate the containment is leaking at 300% per day. 
If that number was applied to Diablo Canyon, it would have to shut down immediately because the, the accident analysis, I can use it because it's an NRC term, uh, is such that they only assume a, a tenth of a percent per day. So this is another example of how the uh, industry uh, pushes the argument. The next piece is um, a, a piece of nuclear fuel. This is in a scanning electron microscope and uh, it was done by Marco Kaltofen at uh, Worcester Polytechnic. Um, the the uh, fascinating part of it is this was found 300 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi. So an accident, disaster, doesn't end at the site boundary. This is 300 miles away. And if it's on the, this was picked up in a vacuum cleaner bag. If, um, uh, if it's on the vacuum cleaner bags, it's in your lungs because you're breathing in whatever winds up on the floor. Next slide, these are car air filters. Each one of those black dots is a hot particle. Yeah. And if you look really carefully, if we had a great slide projector, actually we have one hot particle in a car air filter in Seattle. Uh, but the Fukushima City ones are, are obviously the worst. And a car breathes in just about what a person breathes in. So that the, um, uh, God help us when these people get out 10 or 15 years and we start to see an incidence, an increased incidence of lung cancer. Like Steve Wing discovered at TMI. But according to the NRC, TMI didn't happen either. Okay, the last one in this series, um, Fairwinds asked for uh, children's shoes. And uh, we got uh, seven pairs of shoes from Fukushima Daiichi, and we compared them with seven pairs of shoes in the United States. And ba basically, the, the shoes on the right are, uh, that's the lower limit of detection. That's the best the instrument can do. The shoes of US kids are squeaky clean, and the shoes of the Japanese kids are loaded with seasoning. Well, what do kids do? You know, they tie their shoes, they put their hands in their mouth, and it's all over the place in, in Japan. So the second conclusion is that um, we went from a partial meltdown to a complete meltdown to three complete meltdowns. And the consequences are getting worse and the accident frequency is shortening. That's not a good trend. And it's actually going to get worse as these plants get older. You know, Diablo is now 30 plus years old in operating years but it actually was designed in the 60s, and they built the reactor backward and things like that that slowed down the construction. But we're looking at a 1960s technology with 1960s concrete, um, and uh, uh, when as things get old, they all break down. That's my body keeps telling me I'm going to. So uh, conclusion number th number two is that we're disaster frequency is uh, I'm sorry disaster severity is increasing. So the third piece of this is um, revolves around the, the key piece of nuclear power that no one wants you to know about. Now, we all know that when a uranium atom splits in half, it gives off lots of energy. That's what makes nuclear power so cool, and that's what makes nuclear bombs explode. Take uranium, split it in half, and you get lots of energy. If it stopped there, we wouldn't have problems at Daiichi. But it doesn't stop there, and this is what they don't tell you about. The, the explosion in the middle, the nuclear chain reaction in the middle, only gives off 93% of the heat. The other 7% comes from these pieces that are left over, that piece and that piece. They remain, sorry, they remain physically hot and radioactively hot for hundreds of years. So when Fukushima Daiichi had a safely shut down, it stopped the chain reaction. The, there were no new uranium atoms splitting. But the pieces left behind were still churning out 7% of the power. 7% doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot, except that, let's look at Daiichi Unit 2, that was 4 million horsepower. 7% of 4 million is 270,000 horsepower of heat that had to get rid of. And the nuclear reactor core is only 12 by 12 by 12. So think about 270,000 horses in the space 12 by 12 by 12, and you've got to get rid of that heat, and you can't. So um, what, what happened at Daiichi was that you all heard that the wave came in and knocked out the diesels, and 
because the diesels couldn't run, there wasn't cooling water. Uh, that's true, but even if the diesels were on top of the Empire State Building, Daiichi still would have had a meltdown. And, and this is why, right around the water is a pile of rubble. And those are the cooling pumps that were designed to take away that quarter of a million horsepower from each reactor. The wave destroyed the cooling pumps. We call that the loss of the ultimate heat sink, Lewis. But the, um, so it doesn't matter. People will say, well, at Diablo, the reactor building's at 80 or 90 feet. The cooling pumps are at the water. So if a tsunami were to come, it's not going to hit the building, but it's going to knock out the pumps along the water. And uh, the nuclear industry has phrased the problem, so we don't have a problem with Diablo because we're way up on the cliff. The pumps aren't up on the cliff because if they were, they couldn't pump the water. The pumps are down at the water. And that's a critical, uh, a critical problem that was never addressed. So on this issue of the, uh, Fukushima could have been much worse. That when the tsunami hit, it knocked out almost all the pumps. One pump, uh, uh, one pump survived at, uh, at Daiichi, a couple down the road at Daini, but there were 14 nuclear power plants that lost their cooling water. 14 nuclear power plants lost their cooling water, which meant that, um, and of the diesels, there were 37 diesels, 24 failed to start. They only had 12 diesels to cool 14 nuclear power plants. And had it been just a hair worse, we would not have had three meltdowns, like at Daiichi, we would have had 14. Mm -hmm. And that's not a problem to take out Japan. That's the kind of problem that takes out the Northern Hemisphere. So the, um, the issue of luck plays an important piece of this. So the Daiichi could have been much worse. It was a complete technical failure. Every single system that was designed to work didn't. And we owe our, uh, uh, our, our life in, the, in, the, in this hemisphere to the courage of a couple hundred Japanese uh, workers on the site. Uh, and so courage is, is, is critical to this. The plant manager um, was highly respected by the people and when he stayed, they stayed. So, uh, you know, I always dedicate my speeches to these couple hundred people. We call them the Fukushima 50. There was probably more than 50, but um, less than 200 people that stayed behind and now are getting leukemia as a, as a result. So that's number one. The other piece is luck. Uh, when this accident happened, when this disaster happened, the wind was blowing out to sea about 80% of the time. Now, had the wind been going the other way, as it does during some seasons in Japan, Japan would have been cut in half by the radiation releases just from those three nuclear reactors. You would have had northern Japan, southern Japan, and this uninhabited belt in the, in the middle. Mm -hmm. So luck is that the wind was blowing in the right direction. The other piece of luck was that the, um, it, it happened during the day. There was a thousand people at Daiichi on that Friday, including all the key managers. If it had happened 12 hours later in the middle of the night, there was a hundred people there and no key managers. And the infrastructure for them to get into work was gone. It's not like they could hop in the car and drive into the rescue the place. They could not have gotten there because the the, the infrastructure had been destroyed. So were it not for a couple hundred courageous people and, um, and the luck of a 12-hour difference and when that, when that earthquake and tsunami hit, um, this, act, this disaster at Daiichi would have taken out the, the country of Japan and uh, highly contaminated the, uh, the, nor the Northern Hemisphere as well. This is uh, Naoto Khan's comment about the, uh, the accident. Khan was the prime minister at the time of the accident. Um, and he said, our existence as a sovereign nation was at stake. Now, this parallels what uh, Gorbachev said in his memoirs. Gorbachev claims that the, the Soviet Union collapsed, not because of Perestroika, but because of Chernobyl. So the two prime ministers who lived through this, one democratically elected and, and, and one a, a, a communist uh, uh, leader, um, both came to the same conclusion that this is a technology that is capable of destroying a country overnight. Mm -hmm. And unlike all the other things we live with, nuclear power can destroy the fabric of a country overnight. 
So, next slide. Is, uh, is nuclear power too big to fail? That would be, I think, the image you get when you look at this robust structure. But in fact, we've seen now three times at Daiichi 1, Daiichi 2, and Daiichi 3 that, uh, that that's false. But I like to say it this way. Sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the fools. <laughs> So now, last piece here is what does this mean for, uh, uh, for California and the West Coast? It does mean that radiation knows no borders. You know, it doesn't stop at the it's a Japanese accident and the radiation says, whoop, I gotta go back over the line and return to Japan. No, we're, we're all in this together. Radiation knows no borders. What, what I was able to do is put together this little piece here that uh, sort of explains the impact on California better than anything else I've seen. The, um, the meltdown at Daiichi caused uh, 400 tons of water per day to be released into the Pacific. Um, TEPCO's frantically catching it in all these tanks. Um, those blue things and the silver things, they weren't there when the plant was built, but they were building about a tank every two or three days trying to frantically catch this water, yet 400 tons a day was going into the uh, Pacific. What does that mean? That's the equivalent of 25,000 tractor loads mm. of radioactive liquid being dumped in the, into the Pacific. Mm. And it hasn't stopped. That's just in the first four years. Well, let's talk about what that, what that means. Should you be worried living in, in California? And I'll use this block as an example. Uh, the block is 10 by 10 by 10. So 10 times 10 times 10. There's a, there's a thousand pieces in that, in that block. And when I went to school, we were told dilution is the solution to pollution. And I think that the Daiichi issue is showing that we all live in a world that's awfully, awfully small to dilute. So let's take a look at that first big block. That's 10 by 10 by 10. So let's just say each piece of that means a rem. And a rem is a, a unit, rank and equivalent. Man, it's a unit of radiation. You can think in sieverts, a thousand rem is 10 sieverts. Um, but I, I grew up with rem, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with rem. A thousand rem, if I gave you a block, if I gave you a block of a thousand rem, um, you're dead in, in, in an hour. So now let's take a tenth of that. Let's split the block into a hundred. So now this is 10 by 10 by 1. So this is a block of a hundred rem. So if I gave out a hundred rem, a hundred rem to the first 10 people here, one of the 10 of you would die of cancer. And we call this the linear no threshold uh, uh, um, radiation theory. And it, what it means is as I keep cutting that block, I never get to the point where there's some de minimis dose that we don't have to worry about. Someone will get cancer from, this, from that radiation. So we've gone to uh, 100 rem. One out of 10 people exposed to 100 rem will die of cancer. So let's go down. Now we're 10 by one by one, so this is 10 rem. And if I spread that out to everybody in the room, there would be an increase of one, one of you would get a cancer from that radiation. But what's happening here, and I think you can see what the public policy people are counting on, is that the, uh, statistically, about 40% of Americans die of cancer anyway. So to pick up that one extra person out of the 40 is uh, epidemiologically really difficult. So the more it gets diluted, the less likely you, know, you are to know who's going to die of cancer. But you can be sure that someone will. And that's the, the, the last slide, it goes the same way. This, so the, as radiation gets diluted, it doesn't mean that it hits some de minimis level and uh, everybody's safe. So when they talk about the, the fish in the Pacific are safe, um, really that's not true. But what's happening is there's, there's about two billion people in the, in the Pacific. And there's a whole heck of a lot of these 10 by 10 by 10 uh, cubes being thrown into the Pacific. So what you're doing is you've got the cancer incidence down, so it's extraordinarily difficult 
for a uh, epidemiologist to detect it in a, in, in a population, but that there'll be thousands and tens of thousands of cancers you can count on. We just don't know who. But is Fukushima causing cancers in the Pacific Basin? Absolutely. And um, so our, when I hear public health officials saying, well, that fish only has 10 becquerel, so therefore it's safe to eat. That's really not what they should be saying. That fish has 10 becquerel, so if you get cancer, we won't be able to prove it came from Fukushima. That's the real way the statement should be, uh, should be made. So should you be worried? Um, personally, I, I've made the decision not to eat fish in the Pacific until my regulators measure the fish and tell me what's in it. Um, that's a personal decision, and there are uh, people who, who are eating the fish in the Pacific. There's an issue called bioaccumulation, which dilution is not related to. So that as, these, uh, as this radiation moves out into the environment, it gets picked up by the seaweed. We're already seeing concentration in the seaweed. Then the critters that eat the seaweed get even more. It's almost like um, mercury and tuna. You know how it works its way up the food chain? And we will see, over time, increased concentrations of, um, of radiation <coughs> at the top of the food chain. The, the salmon, the shark, the uh, tuna, uh, et cetera. Um, so this issue of dilution as a solution to pollution only assumes that it's in the water and is not bioaccumulating, which makes the problem even worse. All right, well, thank you. Um, the, as, I, as we say in our little button here, radiation knows no borders. Um, and uh, uh, as Farrah Rinse. I just want to talk about the, the slide just before this. I ask him. Yeah. Go back to which now? This one. Yeah. <coughs> okay. But what's happening there is you know, the concentration of radiation um, near Daiichi was large, but then as it moves out into the Pacific over time, um, it dilutes, but the same number of atoms are at play. So the, uh, what you're seeing in the Pacific now is that the center of the Pacific is relatively <coughs> uncontaminated compared to <coughs> the Aleutian Islands down to Vancouver and down the, down the California coast. And that, that, that will continue to move south until it gets to about the equator and starts to spin around again. And the, but the source is not decaying. Um, Ken, uh, Ken Buesler and I have disagreements, but one of the things I absolutely agree with Ken on is that the concentrations in the Pacific clearly show that the plant is continuing to bleed into the Pacific. If it had been a one-shot deal, if it happened in the first month and then was solved, we wouldn't see this problem right now. So that, the, that Fukushima is continuing to bleed in the Pacific is, uh, I think, one of the key uh, issues that Woods hold was very first to identify, and my hat's off to him.